Welcome to Ecoshun's Almost Ultimate Guide to Crochet, where you will learn almost all of the ins and outs of learning how to crochet. We have a lot to get through in this guide, so let's go ahead and get started. Before you can even learn how to crochet, you need to invest in the right materials. There's tons of different materials out there for crocheting, but you really only need a couple to get started. One of the most important materials in crochet is the yarn. Yarn comes in many different sizes and types, some easier than others to manipulate for beginners. The yarn size basically tells you how thick the yarn is and can make a project you're working on lightweight or heavy depending on the weight that you choose. Different weights are preferred over others depending on the project you're working on. For an example, if you're making a pair of crochet socks, you would need a fingering weight 1 yarn. The yarn weight is usually always on the back of the yarn label. I personally recommend to start with a weight 4 yarn as a beginner since it's easiest to learn with. The more you work with yarn, the easier it'll be to tell which weight a yarn is even without looking at the label. A little tip is if you don't have the correct yarn size you want to work with, you can always double the strands of yarn to make the next size up. So if you combine two strands of a weight 3 yarn, then you'll end up with a weight 4 yarn. The weights can also differ based on what type of yarn you're using. There are many different types of yarn. The type of yarn refers to the type of fibers used to make the yarn. Here's a quick overview of the different types of fibers. Acrylic yarn is a synthetic yarn that is easily accessible and includes many different color options. It's great if you're someone who has sensitive skin or allergies, and it's budget friendly. The downsides are that it is synthetic so it isn't environmentally sustainable, and it isn't a breathable fiber so it'll hold in odors a lot faster than the other fibers. On the plus side, it is machine washable. Some brands I recommend are Paintbox Yarns, Impeccable, and Lion Brand. Wool is a fiber that comes from sheep that consists of many different options like mohair, merino, alpaca, and more. It is more sustainable than acrylic and is a natural fiber, however it can sometimes be itchy depending on the wool that you choose and a potential allergen if you have an allergy to lanolin, which is wax secreted from sheep skin. Since it does come from animals, it's not vegan friendly, however there are many ethical brands like Wool and the Gang, We Are Knitters, Malabringo, Loopy Mango, and more that I highly recommend if you're able to afford it. There are also specific certifications on some wool brands that let you know that the sheep has been taken care of properly when getting sheared if you're someone who cares about animal welfare. Cotton is another natural fiber that's more breathable, especially for summer. Cotton yarn does come in a smaller size, however, which makes it a lot more expensive for larger projects. Some brands I recommend are Peaches and Cream, Mila Mila, and Paintbox yarns. Other types of fibers include hemp, bamboo, polyester, raffia, silk, linen, nylon, and more. There are also yarn types that combine one or more fibers, like a wool and acrylic blend, a silk and mohair blend, or a bamboo and cotton blend. If you want more information on how to read yarn labels, I linked an amazing blog post that details everything you need to know about the symbols on a yarn label. The next incredibly important material for crochet is dun -da -da -da, the crochet hook. A crochet hook will let you actually manipulate the yarn into the project of your dreams. There are many different hook sizes which can get a bit confusing, but the best way to know which hook size to use is to refer to the label on the yarn that you chose. The yarn majority of the time will have a symbol like this one on the label that tells you the best size is suitable for working with that yarn in particular. Here's a chart with different hook sizes as well as suitable projects for the sizes. There are about 4 sizes for the crochet hooks that I know of, but I usually just use the metric system to read my crochet hooks. There are also different types of crochet hooks. An ergonomic hook, which is the one that I always use, is great for your hands if you want to avoid a lot of strain due to the rubbery handle. Aluminum hooks are a great hook to start with since they're able to slip through the stitches easily. Plastic or resin hooks are incredibly stylish and you can find a lot of different sellers online creating their own hooks if you want to support a small business. Wooden or bamboo hooks are another great hook to use that has a great hold on the yarn as you work with it so the yarn doesn't slip off as easily, especially when you're using a lightweight yarn. If you're going to use my recommendations for what yarn and crochet hook to start practicing with, I recommend starting with a weight 4 yarn and a 5mm ergonomic hook or 
a 5mm aluminum crochet hook. One thing to note is how loose or tight you want the project to end up. For an example, I have this weight 4 yarn. If I want the perfect balance for this yarn, I would choose to use a 5mm hook, which creates this square that isn't too tight or too loose. If I want a tighter square, I would use a 4.5mm hook or even a 4mm hook, which creates these squares. And if I want a looser square, I would choose a 5.5mm, 6mm, or even a 6.5mm hook, depending on how loose I want the squares to be. The larger the hook with a small yarn will create loose gaps that can be ideal if you're wanting to make a project that is very spacey. If you prefer tightly crocheted projects, then a smaller hook is ideal, but it's all up to preference on what you'd want to work with. It's best to create swatches as practice to test out which hook size you prefer to use with the yarn that you've chosen before creating a larger project. For beginners, I recommend using the hook size that the yarn label tells you, and then once you get better at crocheting, you can go ahead and choose whatever hook size you prefer for your specific project. Here are some other materials for crocheting that I highly recommend. Measuring tape is great to make sure everything is accurate in sizing. Scissors are helpful to cut your yarn and finish up your projects. You can use any scissors you like. Stitch markers are great to mark important places in your projects. These are the stitch markers I use, but if you can't afford to get any, you can honestly use anything that can mark your place, whether it be bobby pins, tied rubber bands, or even small pieces of yarn you can tie in place as well. Lastly, a tapestry needle helps you weave in your ends. Weaving in your ends means making sure the cut ends of your yarn are tied up neatly in your project so that the project won't come undone, but we'll talk more about that later. Now that you have your yarn, your crochet hook, and all of your other important materials, it's now time to officially get started with learning how to crochet. There are a couple of ways I've seen people hold their crochet hook, but the two ways I'm going to show is holding it like a pencil or a pen as if you're about to write or holding it as if it's a knife. I personally hold it as if it's a knife as it's more comfortable for me to work with, but any way you hold it is completely valid as long as it's comfortable for you. To get started with any crochet project, you have to create a slip knot. This makes it so that the yarn can stay on the hook as you get started. To create a slip knot, the way I do it is by taking the edge of the yarn and leaving a bit of a tail. I then twist it around my index finger twice. Then I take the first loop on my finger and pull it over the second loop, making sure to keep it on my finger. I then pull the second loop over again, but this time all the way off my finger. I then slip the loop off my finger and then insert my hook into the loop before taking the two ends hanging and pulling them to tighten the loop on the hook. And that's a slip knot. To hold the yarn so that I have even tension for myself, I take the yarn that's connected to the ball of yarn and twist it around my fingers in a certain pattern. Under my pinky, over my ring finger, under my middle finger, over my index, and then in front of my middle finger. I then use my thumb and middle finger to hold the yarn at the base of the slip knot so that I can keep the yarn on my fingers as well as have control over my tension. I pull the yarn back a bit to make sure that the yarn going across my middle finger is straight. A chain is the beginning base or the foundation for almost every project you'll work on. It can also be used to guide your project at the end of each row, which is called a turning chain. To chain, first make sure you're holding your yarn correctly. Then you're going to take your hook and push it under the yarn you're holding. You're then going to twist the hook clockwise, making sure the yarn is under the hook part. You're then going to twist the hook a bit as you pull the hook and the yarn through the loop that's sitting on your hook. Once it's pulled through, that is counted as one chain. As you create chains, you want to make sure your hold on the yarn isn't super tight or super loose so that the yarn can easily slip through your fingers as you work.
When you're working on the chain, it might be confusing as to where exactly to put your hook. If you turn your chain vertical, you can see that there are these V shapes. Where I usually work is in the top of the V shape here. There's also patterns where they tell you to work into the back bump of the chain and to do that just twist your chain so you're able to see the back and the back bump is this little bar right here. One thing to remember is that the last chain always disappears when you begin your first row of the project. For an example, if you create 80 chains, you'll actually have 79 chains for your first row, since the last chain always counts as a turning chain. So if you want 80 stitches, I would recommend creating 81 stitches in the chain so that when you create your first row, you'll have 80 stitches. There are many stitches in crochet, but here I'm just going to show you the basics that are great to know in order to get started. The first is the single crochet stitch. To single crochet, first and Insert your hook into one of the chain stitches. You're then going to make sure your yarn is over your hook, which is called a yarn over. So you're going to yarn over and then twist your hook. As you twist your hook, pull the yarn through the loop, which is called a pull through. Once the hook and the yarn is through, you'll see that you have two loops on your hook. You're going to yarn over again and pull through both loops. That is a single crochet. You should end up with one loop on your hook. At the end of the row with single crochet, to get started with the second row, you're going to chain one and then turn your work around. For a little tip, you can either chain before or after you turn your work around. It doesn't matter at all. It's just a personal preference. This chain one is a turning chain just like the last chain when you created your starting chain. You can then begin to start single crocheting your second row. If you make a bunch of rows of single crochet, this is what it would look like. This stitch is great if you don't want your projects to have a lot of gaps or if you're making patterns with grids. The next stitch is the half double crochet. To half double crochet, first make sure the yarn is over the hook and then insert your hook into one of the chain stitches. You're then going to yarn over and pull the yarn through the stitch. Once the hook and the yarn is through, you'll see that you have three loops on your hook. You're going to yarn over again and pull through all three loops. That is a half double crochet. You should end with one loop on your hook. At the end of the row with half double crochet, to get started with the second row, you can either chain one or chain two. People recommend to chain two, but I usually chain one just because it's smaller and I just like to do that. There's actually no reason why, but I suggest you start with doing two until you understand crochet a lot better to where you can manipulate it the way you want. You're then going to turn your work around. This chain two is a turning chain. You can then begin to start half double crocheting your second row. Thank you. 
If you make a bunch of rows of half double crochet, this is what it would look like. This stitch is great if you don't mind a bit of a gap and you don't like how long it takes to build up single crochet. Half double crochet is a great in-between stitch for projects and it's a really popular stitch as well. It's my favorite stitch to use for ribbings on sweaters and cardigans. The next stitch is the double crochet stitch. To double crochet, first make sure the yarn is over the hook and then insert your hook into one of the chain stitches. You're then going to yarn over and pull the yarn through the stitch. Once the hook and the yarn is through, you'll see that you have three loops on your hook. You're going to yarn over again and pull through the first two loops. After that, you should have two more loops on your hook. You're going to yarn over once more and pull through the last two loops. That is a double crochet. You should end up with one loop on your hook. At the end of the row with double crochet, to get started with the second row, chain 2 for the turning chain. You're then going to turn your work around. You can then begin to start double crocheting your second row. If you make a bunch of rows of double crochet, this is what it would look like. This stitch is great if you want to quickly create rows and you want a more loose project, especially if you use yarn that's a lot smaller than your hook size. I use double crochet for flowy skirts, beanies, and so much more. The last stitch is the treble crochet stitch. To treble crochet, you're going to wrap the yarn around your hook twice, making sure there's three loops on your hook. Then insert your hook into one of the chain stitches. You're then going to yarn over and pull the yarn through the stitch. Once the hook and the yarn is through, you'll see that you have four loops on your hook. You're going to yarn over again and pull through the first two loops. After that, you should have three more loops on your hook. You're going to yarn over again and pull through the next two loops. You should have two more loops on your hook. Finally, yarn over one more time and pull through the last two loops. That is a treble crochet. You should end up with one loop on your hook. At the end of the row with treble crochet, to get started with the second row, chain 3 for the turning chain. You're then going to turn your work around. You can then begin to start treble crocheting your second row.
if you make a bunch of rows of treble crochet, this is what it would look like. This stitch is great if you want to make rows even faster than double crochet, have an incredibly flowy piece, and have a lot of space and gaps in your project. I like treble crochet to add cool texture to different projects like shrugs and skirts. For any of these stitches on the rows after the first chain row, the rows will look like this. If you turn it so the top is visible, you can see the top looks like horizontal Vs. For any of these stitches, you'll be working into both of these Vs just by inserting your hook into the bottom of them like this. That's how you'll normally work your rows unless the pattern or stitch you're doing says otherwise. Speaking of those V's, this is extra important when you're doing the rib stitch. To do the rib stitch, all you're going to do is choose what stitch you want to use and work them into either the front loop of the V or the back loop of the V for the entire section of the project. If you look at the top where the horizontal V's are, you'll see that there's a loop closest to you and a loop behind it. The one closest to you is the front loop and the one behind it is the back loop. For this, I'll use the single crochet stitch. So work the single crochet stitch into the back loop of each stitch of the row. At the end of the row, chain one for your turning chain, turn your work, and repeat working single crochet into the back loop only. If you continue to do this, this is what the single crochet back loop only ribbed stitch would look like. Here's other swatches to show what it would look like if you were to do half double crochet or double crochet for the same method. I personally prefer either using single crochet or half double crochet for the rib stitch since the double crochet one is just a bit too loose for my preference. I also prefer to use the back loop crochet instead of the front loop since the front loop is less ribby if that makes sense. Here's a comparison between using back loop single crochet and front loop single crochet for reference. The rib is perfect if you're making a sweater with ribbing on the bottom, the cuffs, or even the neck part. Here are the swatches for single, half double, double, and treble stitches so you're able to see the difference between the stitches. If you're working with any of these stitches and forget which row you're working on, then don't worry. You can easily figure out how many rows you've done so far by looking closely at the stitches. For the single crochet stitch, you can turn it vertical and spread the stitches out a bit like this. These little gaps that pop up when you spread it gives away where each row is and you'll be able to count them. This is one row and this is another and so on. You can also turn it back to its normal way to see these line indents in the single crochet. These indicate that you've done two rows, so you can count it easily that way. To count how many stitches are in each row, I just count the little bumps the single crochet stitches push out here and count it down like that. For the half double crochet stitch, every other row kind of pops out for some reason, so that's how I'm able to count the rows if I need to. To count the stitches, I just count these column looking stitches and I'm able to see how many stitches are in each row. For the double crochet, you can count the rows a lot easier just by counting the columns like this. The same way can be used to count how many stitches are in each row. To tell the difference between half double and double crochet, it helps to know that the columns in the double crochet stitches are a lot longer than the half double crochet ones. Another thing is that the double crochet stitches are a lot flatter and don't really pop out like the half double crochet stitches do on every other row. For treble crochet, the columns are a lot longer than double crochet and are incredibly easy to count the rows or stitches just by counting the column stitches. To count the rows on rib stitches, you can take a close look at the ridges the stitch creates. Think of it like a mountain. On one side, you have to climb up and the other side you have to climb down. For each of those sides contains one row so you can count it like that. A slip stitch is a stitch used to either create a nice edge on a project, used to join two projects together, or to join two sections of stitches together to join it in the round. To slip stitch all you have to do is insert your hook into one of the stitches. 
then yarn over and pull the yarn through the stitch. Once you have two loops on your hook, pull one of the loops on your hook through the other to have one more remaining. And that's a slip stitch. To slip stitch two sides together, all you have to do is fold the sides to where they touch and then insert your hook into the closest side you can. Then slide the hook into the other side as well. And then slip stitch those sides together. If you slip stitch on the wrong side of your project, when you turn it inside out, the slip stitch won't be seen. If you're joining your project in the round, which is just making the project work all in one go instead of having to turn your work each time the row is finished, you're going to use the slip stitch to join the first stitch of the row and the last stitch of the row together. The magic circle is typically used when making amikurumi, which are crochet plushies essentially, and other pieces in the round like hats or even coasters. There are two methods I use to create magic circles. The first method is by taking the tail end of the yarn and wrapping it twice around your fingers. Hold the yarn under your thumb like this to keep the yarn still. Then take your hook and push it under the first yarn and then over the second. When it goes over the second yarn, twist the hook so it faces down, and then pull the second yarn under the first yarn. As you pull it under the first yarn, twist your hook so it makes a loop on your hook. Let the loop push down the hook's neck a bit. The yarn should be making an X on your fingers. You're then going to take your hook and push it under the second yarn like this, and pull it through the loop that's already on the hook. Most of the times it'll be hard, so I just gently take my hand out and then use my fingers to pull it through, which is a lot easier. And that makes the magic circle. You're then gonna chain the amount you need based on the stitch you're going to use, and the magic circle is complete. You can then begin working your pattern into the circle that was made in the middle. After the amount of stitches you need are there, you can pull the little tail to close the gap. Then slip stitch into the first stitch of the row and you're ready to start working on the next row of your project. The second method is a lot easier, and all you have to do is first create a slip knot. Then chain three. You're then gonna insert your hook into the first chain and create a slip stitch. Then chain the amount you need based on the stitch you're going to use, and the magic circle is complete. You can then begin working your pattern into the little gap that was made into the middle.
After the amount of stitches you need are there, you can pull the little tail to close the gap. Then slip stitch into the first stitch of the row and you're ready to start working on the next row of your project. While working on a project, sometimes you'll get to the end of your yarn and feel worried about what to do, but there's an incredible way to solve this. You can also use this method for switching colors, especially if you're creating graphs in your project. To add yarn or switch colors in the beginning of your project, take the new yarn and loop it around your hook. Then pull the new yarn through with your hook. This loops count as a chain. If you don't need any more chains, then turn your work. If you do, then chain the amount you need before turning. After the yarn has been added, I like to weave in my ends as I continue to work on the row so I won't have to do it at the end. This saves you a ton of time, trust me. To weave in the ends as you go, all you have to do is hold down the old yarn and the new yarn's tail to the side of the project, either in the front or the back. Then as you crochet whatever crochet stitch you're doing, make sure you're going under the old yarn and the yarn tail as you work so it traps the yarn inside. After a couple of stitches, you can cut the old yarn and the tail off. To add yarn or switch colors in the middle of your project, first begin working whatever stitch you use. For this example, I'm using the half double crochet stitch. After I finish the first part of doing the half double crochet, making sure that I have three loops on my hook, I drop my old yarn and loop the new yarn onto my crochet hook. I then finish the half double crochet with the new yarn and then crochet normally, making sure to weave in the old yarn and the new yarn's tail as I continue. For a little reference, if you're changing color with single crochet, you'll change the color after you have two loops on your hook. If you're changing color with double crochet, you'll change the color after you have two loops on your hook. Sometimes you'll have to add more stitches to a row or take away stitches from a row. Adding more stitches is called increasing and taking away stitches is called decreasing. These methods help with shaping your crochet pieces the way you want them to. For an example, for skirts I make, I always increase around the hip area so the skirt can be the perfect fit for me. And for sleeves, I always decrease so that the sleeves fit perfectly around my arm, yet making sure it's also big enough for my shoulders. To increase, all you have to do is add two crochet stitches to one stitch. So choose which stitch you want to use in this example, I'll be using half double crochet. First, add one half double crochet into the first stitch. Then if you add one more, that's an increase. If you add more than three increases to every stitch, this creates ruffles which will be more defined the more increases you add into each stitch. To decrease, there's two methods I use. The first method is just by skipping over a stitch and then continue working like normal. The second method I use is working the first half of your stitch into one stitch. Since I'm using half double crochet in this example, I work into the stitch and make sure I have three loops on my hook. I then insert my hook into the next stitch, yarn over, and pull through, which makes four loops on my hook. I then yarn over and pull through all four loops. This creates a decrease. For a single crochet decrease, I just work half a single crochet into the first stitch so that there's two loops on my hook. Then I work into the next stitch, which makes three loops on my hook. Then I yarn over and pull through all three loops. 
for a double crochet decrease, I just work half a double crochet into the first stitch so that there's three loops on my hook. Then I work into the next stitch which makes four loops on my hook. I then yarn over and pull through three loops which makes two loops on my hook. I then yarn over for the last time and pull through the last two loops. When your project is all done and you're ready to finish it off, all you have to do is create a chain, cut a tail which I recommend leaving a couple inches of to give you enough yarn to weave in later, and pull your hook up so that the tail comes out of the chain and secures the end of the project. To keep your project from unraveling, you have to weave in any tails like the one we just made. To weave in the tail, I take my tapestry needle and insert the tail inside of the needle. I then pull the needle through a couple of the little column sections of the project. To make it extra secure, I weave into them twice. Then I cut off the remaining tail and the project is complete. Here are some quick tips that have helped me as I got better at crocheting. Sometimes it's hard to keep your rows even and avoid the project from hourglassing. So what I like to do when I feel like I might have a hard time remembering is take my stitch markers and add it into the first and last stitch of the row so that whenever I reach those stitches, I know that working in them will keep my project straight. If you make a mistake, it's incredibly easy to fix it. All you have to do is remove your hook and pull the yarn that's attached to the ball to take apart the project until you reach that part where you made the mistake. Doing this is called frogging. Measurements, especially when it comes to wearables, are extremely important, so it's good to know how to measure yourself and your pieces properly. Before I start though, I just want to say that I know that gauge is really important, however, I just don't do it. It's important when you want to work on patterns from other people, however, I just, I just don't want to do it. But I do recommend for beginners to learn how to do gauge, and because I don't do gauge, I can't really explain how to do it properly. So I linked down an incredible article down below on how to do gauge for crochet. Now, since I don't do gauge, this is how I accurately measure myself to make clothes. Whenever I want to make a crochet project, I always first make sure that all of my measurements are up to date and written down. For tops, I measure my bust, my waist, my arm length, my shoulder width, my arm circumference. For bottoms, I measure the widest part of my hips, my leg length, the widest part of my thighs, and the widest part of my calves. Having these measurements written down saves me a lot of time in crocheting, but I also like to try on the piece as I crochet just to make sure all the measurements are perfect to my body. Another way to make sure the measurements for the pieces you wanna make are accurate is to measure pieces that you own that's similar to what you wanna make. For an example, if you wanna make a sweater in a similar size to the ones you already own, you can just measure the different sections of those pieces. I would measure it on the floor as well as measure it when it's on your body, just for a double measurement in case you want to change anything. Crochet is stretchy, and because it's stretchy, you need to make sure you take a couple inches off your measurements and adjust the sizing as needed so that when it does stretch, it stretches to fit you perfectly. Here's a chain as an example. I want this chain to be 10 inches. If I crochet the chain until it reaches 10 inches on my measuring tape, when I stretch it, it goes to 13 and a half inches. So I have to crochet it until it reaches 8 inches. Then when I stretch it, it'll stop exactly at 10 inches. So make sure you do at least 2 to 3 inches less than the measurement you want. 
Okay, so another important part of crochet is blocking your items. I have this cardigan that I made almost two years ago and I haven't blocked it. The sleeves on it is a bit short on me, so I want to be able to block it so that the sleeves can be a bit longer and the yarn can be a bit softer. Um, blocking your items makes them more delicate, more professional looking, and it makes the stitches more even amongst other things. Uh, for this part of the blocking process, you're gonna need some wool wash and a towel. This is the wool wash that I'm using here, and this is the towel. So the first things first is to fill up the tub. The tub is filled. I just filled it up enough so that the cardigan could fit in there. And now I'm going to take the wool wash here and just, it says to put one tablespoon, but I'm just gonna That should be good. And now I take my cardigan and throw it in there. So I'm just gonna let the cardigan soak in the wool wash and the water, making sure it's completely submerged. And it says that the water would get a little murky, but that's just like taking out all the oils and the fibers and stuff. But be gentle with it. Like this cardigan was made with acrylic, so it's fine if I'm a little rough with it, but if you're using wool, or if you have like a crochet project that uses like 100% wool, then you definitely wanna be gentle with it. Now I'm just gonna let this soak for 15 minutes and then we will dry it. So while the cardigan is soaking in the water, um, in the meantime, I am going to get another part of the things you'll need together, which is blocking mats. Uh, it's not required, people just say you can use towels, but I have a mostly carpeted apartment, so I'm gonna use blocking mats, which took me at least like six months to get because these are expensive. These were like $44 for only two, four, six, eight. For nine mats, it was $40. I think you're better off just stealing some from an elementary school, but whatever by the way you don't have to get these blocking mats especially since they're on the pricier side so i would recommend getting children's mats which is a lot cheaper and comes with more mats than the blocking mats did you can use cut out cardboard boxes or even old yoga mats thank you to everyone that messaged me on instagram about these alternative options i honestly wish that i had them beforehand because i could have saved money but it's okay Right, the blocking mats are all set i also have these two extra ones that i bought a long time ago thinking that would be enough to block stuff and it also came with these little pins that you're going to use to pin down whatever you're blocking i also put this towel down just to be safe because i've never done this so yeah this is so heavy oh my gosh after the 15 minutes are done, drain the water in the tub and press down on the piece you're blocking to get all the water out without wringing it. The cardigan was so heavy, but once I got some of the water out, I was able to lift it out of the tub and onto the towels. My camera died when I was actually taking the rest of the water out, so I'm repeating the motions here, but all you have to do is press the water out of the piece with the towels. I folded the towels over the piece and just pressed down firmly to soak out all the water. I heard it's not a good idea to twist the piece since it's delicate, it, so just press down as much as you can. With my cardigan and wet socks, I went ahead and placed the cardigan onto the blocking mats, making sure it was completely flat and stretched out. The mats came with these T-shaped pins that hold your piece in place when blocking, so I just stuck all of these around the cardigan, making sure to stretch the arms out as much as it allowed since I wanted them to be slightly longer. The entire thing here is pinned down and stretched out. And now we have to wait 12 hours or more for it to dry. 
Two days later, the cardigan was finally dry, so I took out all of the pins and tried it on to compare it to how it was before blocking. After putting it on, I could already tell the difference between how it was before and now. The squares were a lot more flatter compared to before when they were a bit more puffy around the places they were sewed together. The sleeves were also longer, which made me really happy, and the piece felt longer even though it measured the same as before, but the whole cardigan in general felt renewed, softer, and just a lot more pleasant than before. I like to make a lot of my pieces from scratch and I feel like the more that you do it, the easier it gets. To figure out how to make pieces from scratch, it's good to study the pieces that you already own to figure out how it's constructed. For an example, this sweater here has different seams all over. If you look at the seams in the different sides of the sweater, it tells you it consists of four different panels, front and the back panel, and then the two arm panels. It also consists of a bottom ribbing, two arm cuff ribbings, and a neck ribbing. If you recreate these panels in crochet and make sure that all of the measurements are accurate, you'll have your own handmade sweater. You can even study pieces you see on the runways from your favorite clothing stores and just take notes of the different panels and how everything was constructed. Make sure to always try on your pieces as you work on them to make sure that the measurements are accurate because you don't wanna finish a huge project and at the end of the day, it doesn't fit. And while you work on that piece, make sure to write down everything that you do step by step so later down the line if you want to make another version but maybe a longer version or a shorter version, all you have to do is refer back to your notes and it'll take less time to create it. This can apply to basically anything that you want to make. Pants, bags, pillows, anything. Just study the construct of the items and basically just replicate them as much as you can while adding your own flair and creativity to it. Now that you know how to crochet, what should you even make? Learning how to crochet now is probably the best time ever because there's so many tutorials online and because crochet is so versatile, you can literally create anything you want. You can look on YouTube, TikTok, Instagram, and Pinterest for different crochet inspiration. You can look online on your favorite clothing websites and even try to recreate what you see just for extra practice. You can, I don't know, watch my videos too if you want. I also linked down below my Pinterest board for fun, aesthetic, crochet inspiration. Here are some inspiration for beginner level projects that are simple and easy to learn and can help you develop your skills. You can start by making flat projects that only work vertical like blankets, small rugs for your room, or square coasters that are checkered so you can enhance your color changing skills. You can make cute accessories like hand warmers which are incredibly simple and use the same stitch all around. You can make scarves, ribbed beanies, or even beanies using the magic circle. If you want to practice with the magic circle more you can make themed coasters placemats for your dresser or dining table cute little jewelry mats and more you can also make cute little pouches for tiny trinkets you collect or basic granny square bags for shopping for wearables you can make a patchwork cardigan which is basically just making a bunch of squares in different colors and then attaching them together you can make a two top that's incredibly easy or even a simple bralette you can practice your amigurumi skills by making cute little keychains small pillows or even taking it a step forward and creating your own plushie i have all of these in more linked down in my Pinterest in the description box below. You've officially reached the end of this guide. I hope everything was incredibly helpful for you and if you have any questions just let me know down in the comments below. I'll see you soon. Bye!